Uh, good morning once again and a warm welcome to UCT Africa virtually in tea. Uh, those of us who are joining us from uh, within the continent of Africa and outside the continent, uh, welcome, welcome. We have uh, two uh, interesting presentations lined up today. Uh, the first from a registrar at the University of Cape Town, Charles Moyo, um, uh, that presented to the Critis Care Hospital. And uh, second, uh, from Dr. Samuel Okerosi, who's a consultant at the Machakos Level 5 Hospital in, uh, in Kenya. So uh, a thank you and a warm welcome to both our speakers and presenters today. Um, uh, just before Charles uh, starts, I'd like to just uh, mention if you can uh, kindly keep your microphones unmuted uh, throughout the course of the presentation. Um, if you have a question, uh, you can please type it using the chat function or you can go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask it when I give you the cue. Um, and um, just a reminder once again, if you haven't registered, just to register on the chat function using your name, uh, position, institution, and country. Uh, uh, Dr. Charles Moyo, uh, welcome to you. Are you ready? Yes, that's yeah. Can I can you allow me to share my screen? Um, it's allowed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and can you hear me loud and clearly? Yes, can hear you hear you well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much once more for once more for this opportunity. My name is Dr. Charles Moy. I'm one of the ENT registrars uh, here at Curtis Care Hospital. So today I would lead a discussion of uh, this case, which was initially managed at uh, Red Cross, uh, that is our children's hospital, and uh, uh, subsequently managed here at, at Curtis Cape when he was, uh, of course, uh, above the age of 18. So I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I obtained consent uh, for the use of patient's clinical data for this presentation. Um, and I, know, I have no intention for copyright infringement. And uh, my uh, the content of the, the content of the presentation is uh, referenced. So I'll straight away go to the history. Uh, Mr. Emma is a 33-year-old uh, male who stays uh, in a shack, a kind of a, a poor social circumstances, uh, from, uh, you know, from the social perspective. He was born in February. It's quite a long uh, uh, clinical history. But I will try to summarize. He was born in February 1987, and he presented at Red Cross Children's Hospital at around uh, uh, five months of age, and he was admitted for a severe form of coup. Uh, he had a laryngoscopy done during the same presentation, where they noted a suprabiotic, a, a glottic, and subglottic airway edema. He was subsequently intubated uh, to maintain his upper airway, and later on, in about a, a bit about a month later, he had a tracheostomy a, a done for a congenital subglottic stenosis and post intubation fibrosis from his previous group admission. And then, in the same year, at around November, he had a laryngotracheoplasty, uh, after which he yet uh, they failed to extubate him because the graft was collapsing into the airway. He had an unfortunate event uh, and he suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest due to a blocked tracky tube and a hypoxic encephalopathy with the residual spastic cerebral palsy. And then at about three years later, he had another airway procedure. He had a tracheal resection in 1990 and tissue fixation. Uh, after which, uh, after a month later, post tracheal and tissue fixation, the tissue was removed because he had, he had developed granulomas which were including his upper airway and had a tracheostomy uh, tube uh, uh, subsequently inserted. So he coped well with the tracheostomy tube for plus or minus 12 years until the age of about 15, uh, and he was successfully decannulated at the age of 15. And of note uh, in his history is that in, uh, in 2011, he was uh, also treated for TB mastoiditis. So his most recent presentation, that is this year in 2020, 
he presented to the general sessions in February where he had a perianal abscess and he was taken to theater for incision and drainage of that perianal abscess. And then post-operatively, he developed a stridor, uh, which required intubation to maintain his airway. Of note is that he was not vocalizing, he was only clicking, he was bed bound. Um, and he subsequently had a DLTB uh, by our team in February this year, and by balloon dilation and a tracheostomy uh, uh, inserted. And however, he was uh, lost uh, to follow up uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic. And these were the findings, uh, these pictures were the findings of the initial DLTP in February 2020. He had, uh, uh, the findings were that he had biotic and supraglottic edema. Uh, this was the subglottic uh, area which shows a stenotic uh, segment, cotton wire, grade three subglottic stenosis. He also had a persistent small uh, tracheocutaneous uh, fistula. And in the same setting, that is when he had the tracheostomy done. As you can see here, after the balloon dilation, he, the, the airway was uh, still compromised. So that is why he had a tracheostomy uh, patient. And then, uh, as I alluded previous, that he was lost to follow up. He then uh, presented again, uh, he came to the outpatients again, uh, that was in July. He was then admitted, he was coughing, he had a lot of secretions coming from his trachea. He was uh, coughing and he made a, a, a provisional diagnosis of the tracheitis with the blocked tracheostomy tube. The tracheostomy tube was replaced. We managed to get a CT scan of his neck and chest. We did a barium swallow just to make sure he was not aspirating, which was normal. And then uh, we noted that they also stayed uh, at a shack and they had uh, difficulties financially and, and, and they had also difficulties getting transport to a healthcare facility. Um, this is a uh, such a view of a CT scan which basically shows the stenotic uh, segment here just above the tracheostomy tube. So at this uh, moment in time, I will open it up uh, for uh, discussions for any thoughts in terms of uh, the options of management in this case. 33-year-old male patient with uh, poor social circumstances. They uh, presented with a blocked tracheostomy tube. Uh, in view of them staying at a shop, they don't have transport to a healthcare facility in case of an emergency. And uh, if you look at the history again, uh, this patient has had multiple uh, previous airway surgeries and with uh, that grade three Cotumaya subbiotic stenosis. I would open up for any uh, discussion in terms of what are the options uh, in terms of management of this patient. Can you hear me, Tasia? Um, we can hear you, Charles. May, may perhaps could you uh, just okay. put your yes. presentation on the presentation mode? Uh, I think it just fell out of it. Oh, okay. Yep. No, it's fine. Um, sure, great. So I don't know if there are any takers or anyone who wants to. Good morning. Yes, it's uh, Joe Seller here, pathologist. Charles, uh, do you know what the nature of the granulomatous tissue was that was previously biopsied? Um, I, I, I think it was inflammatory, if I remember correctly. I can just make sure, just before the end of the presentation, I can bring the histology uh, up. So, so um, were there no special investigations done? based on the fact that granulomatous inflammation in this country and in this setting very, very uh, likely was, point towards TB. No, 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 it was not granulomatous, it was uh, inflammatory. Uh, oh, granulation tissue. Granulation tissue, yeah. Oh, granulation tissue. Yes. Okay. 
Um, Charles, there's a, there's a raised hand. I'm just going to ask them to perhaps answer your question. Uh, GSH ENT, you can, you can go on. Hello, hello, I just said, morning, Charles. So Hi. I think, uh, if, having listened to the history of the patient, I don't think we have much uh, uh, room to maneuver here because of the social circumstances and also is a cerebral palsy, Charles, spastic, uh, uh, spastic cerebral palsy. Otherwise, we would have options like a balloon dilation or we could do like uh, and more invasive procedures like anterior cricoid split or <coughs> posterior cricoid split or but then because of the comorbidity of cerebral palsy, I wouldn't, I don't think it would be a good idea to do that. So I think it would be better to keep the tracheostomy or at least put a tissue, because at least with a tissue, but I think it would be easier to manage. Yeah, that's what I think. And, and, and Charles, just looking at the CT scan that you showed a bit earlier on as well, it didn't, it, just the level, the length of the stenosis as well, it wasn't uh, very long. And you know, if you're thinking about a patient that has the kind of circumstances that you're describing. You don't, you want to limit how many interventions you're going to be doing on this person. And I would also think, well, Raphael's mentioned endoscopic measures, but what about uh, open resections? Would that be sort of a, an option as well? Yeah, so uh, there are, you know, various options which uh, you, you also need to take, you know, the patient factors, patient circumstances into consideration. You also need to, to look at what uh, expertise you have available and as well as institutional um, factors. So I'll go on to, I'll straight away go on to how we uh, further manage this patient. So we employed a multidisciplinary team approach, which involved uh, the ENT team, the cardiothoracic surgeons, uh, speech and language therapies uh, involved the social worker because of poor social circumstances. We also involved the, the physiotherapist because uh, he, this patient was bed bound and they, they didn't have a wheelchair and it was very difficult to get him into a public transport so he can be transported into um, a hospital facility. Uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Shomani if she's there. She was there in this uh, MTT discussion if she has something to say. Thank you, Charles. Um, so the point of the discussion was to decide whether we would do something as ENT or the cardiothoracics would um, take him to theater or to do nothing. So basically the options were either we could optimize him conservatively, so get his mother to see the social worker to improve uh, their access to the hospital, get the physiotherapist to help with a, a wheelchair so he can mobilize better, and then speech and language therapy to help uh, with swallowing and optimize tracheostomy care. The other option was for us to take him to theater for either the teacher of insertion or um, if we felt his airway wasn't safe to go ahead um, and do a total laryngectomy. There was also um, a discussion of possibly if we felt a total laryngectomy was too much, um, then to proceed with the glottic closure and airway diversion. And then the other option was for the cardiothoracics to proceed with a tracheal resection. So after all things were considered, it was felt best to give him a chance with the conservative management um, and see how he does. And if he failed to cope, then we would have a low threshold to um, proceed with a total laryngectomy. Okay, thank you, Uche. Um I think Tim Penner is also uh, uh, logged on. I don't know if he wants uh, to comment. Well, th thanks, thanks very much for the opportunity. So um, Tim was part of the cardiothoracic team discussing this patient. Um, one of, one of the things that you have to consider is if you're attempting to uh, resect a piece of or resect airway to establish uh, a patent airway, then you need to be able to protect that airway as well. And so given his uh, comorbidities and his uh, high risk for aspiration, um, for me that, that fell out as a potential option to try and reestablish um, an airway for the patient in terms of a, or a natural airway with a resection. So, so really that um, it, 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 it was just going to put him at more risk for further aspiration. So, so I was, uh, and I still feel very strongly that, that, um, 
that trying to establish a, a normal airway um, with resection is not the option for this patient. Um, however, uh, the, the options that were discussed with regards to total laryngectomy or clotted closure um, would be a potential option. Um, but, but again, that's, that's a large surgery on a, on a patient that appeared to be coping relatively well um, um, and was least able to, to suction the airway through the, uh, through the T-tube or with, with, with um, access to the, um, to the airway. So, I mean, I think, you, as you mentioned, you need to take the patient's social circumstances into account and their, and their comorbidities. Um, and, and this patient had um, very severe uh, of both. And so conservative for me was, was definitely the option. But I'm, I'm happy to, um, I am happy for comment on that. But I, I didn't think at all that uh, we should try and reestablish an airway with a resection of this setting. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Pennell. I see uh, Professor Darlene Liber has raised her hand. Uh, Prof. Liber, please go on. Ah, thank you again, yes, Darlene Liber from uh, Gerdeske Hospital. Um, so I was involved with this patient with uh, eventually inserting the, the T-tube. And I think the initial discussion, what's important here is the patient's uh, social circumstances. As one, um, he didn't, curb, a, a permanent track, he would have been the answer. The problem was his family was unable to kind of regularly suction and maintain the patency of that tracheostomy. So, um, you know, I was quite keen on the resection, but what made it difficult here, it was so close to the vocal cords. So we didn't think, and then as Tim said, the risk of uh, aspiration. Uh, and then obviously laryngectomy is a, is a kind of a, a massive procedure. Um, I didn't think the, the glottic closure procedure would be of any benefit in his case because his problem was mostly that the tracheostomy was, gonna get, uh, was getting blocked. So by doing a glottic closure, you're preventing aspiration, but we still haven't addressed the, the continuous blocking of the trachea. So um, the stent for, for us in this case was it's really to see whether one, uh, we can improve his airway, and two, a kind of, um, you know, if that uh, T-tube is uh, occluded the whole time, there's less risk of it crusting with no need to suction, and he's able to kind of cough um, through a normal nose and normal mouth. And then thirdly, to actually see whether he, in fact, has a risk of aspiration. And I think what we saw in this patient, now interesting, was his airway we, uh, we uh, managed to maintain, and his actually, as I understand it, not aspirating, which means that if his T-tube ever occludes or, um, you know, that it, it's um, uh, um, the possibility is there that I think, Tim, that he might well benefit from a re resection because we now know that his supraglottis can protect his airway. Sure, I think that's a good point. And, uh, you know, obviously doing it uh, in a staged uh, fashion to establish that is... is um, we don't close any doors by what we've what we've done so far. I think that's the important point. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why it's so important to have this multidisciplinary approach, you know, to speak to cardiothoracics and, you know, and um, uh, the first uh, um, kind of plan is not necessarily going to be the final plan. But I think uh, we now know what will work for this patient and further possibilities, which is great, you know, working together. Um, thank you, Professor Luba. Thank you, Tim. And then I will proceed. So, again, just to reiterate, we, you know, the considerations were the patient's factors, which played a very significant role in, the, in terms of this uh, patient discussion. Them coming from a shark, um, not having um, a transport money, not having a wheelchair, a difficult to access the healthcare facilities really struggling with a tracheostomy care uh, and uh, as well as this uh, patient having a, a cerebral, cerebral pulse. And we, you also need to look at expertise available. We had the cardiographic surgeons with the expertise from ENT uh, uh, surgeons. If you look at the institution, GSH is an, a tertiary institution. We can offer a endoscopic facilities, laser uh, facilities, post-op uh, intensive care, a unit. So you need to put all these into consideration in terms of your patient uh, management. So this was the plan uh, after the multidisciplinary team uh, discussion. Uh, so we, the plan was to reinforce the tracking care, to review the 
social circumstances uh, to acquire a wheelchair of which we acquired, we provide extra tubes for tracheostomy care that was done, and uh, apply for home-based suction pump of which that was also uh, acquired. So basically we managed to, to achieve uh, all uh, the goals of the conservative uh, management approach. And then, um, however, about a, a few weeks later, this patient presented again. He was coughing a lot. He was admitted uh, for a tracheitis. Uh, he was put on gentamicin nebulization. In view of, uh, of, of, of COVID, we also did a COVID test for him, which was negative. And then uh, at that, uh, in that current admission, we then planned a DLTB, a laser section of the stenosis and a hospitalization. So I'll just uh, play these few videos. Um, intraoperative videos. So as you can see, uh, if you go to the subbiotic area, so initially we had a sense of a, a, a complete a, 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 a stenotic a segment. However, when we probed with the suction tip, there was a small uh, opening and we could visualize the armored tube below the stenotic uh, segment. And we also had a feel of the stenotic segment. It was quite soft. So as you can see, we could uh, visualize the the armor tube just below the stenotic segment, and we palpated, and it was a, a soft stenosis. And then we proceeded with laser resection of the stenotic segment. And here we observed all the laser uh, precautions. We had uh, laser goggles, you know, use of uh, wet traps to cover the patient's eyes and face and use of uh, laser instruments. And it is important that if you are using laser, the FiO2 you should be in constant communication with your anesthetist, and the FiO2 should be kept less than uh, uh, 30%. And they sh uh, in our institution, we use a, a methane blue with saline to inflate uh, the ETT tube um, cup. And then again, it is important that after the anesthetist lower the FiO2, you wait for a few minutes so that the high concentration, so that that high concentration of uh, oxygen in your way, in your airway, gears in order to prevent airway fires. Sorry about that. Again, it is important uh, in our institution we use the uh, neurosurgical plates, place them just above uh, the ETT tube to prevent uh, damaging your ETT tube from laser and to prevent the risk of uh, getting airway fire. So, this is uh, more or less how uh, it looked like uh, after laser section of the stenotic segment. So post-operatively, the patient did very well. He had no stride, he was breathing comfortably uh, with his tissue uh, in situ and closed. That is the external component was uh, closed. He was fitting well. We asked a speech therapy to uh, assess him. He was clinically not aspirating. We kept him for a few days and we had to discharge him to review him in about two weeks to assess his airway. This was his scope on follow-up. This was actually last week. So we scoped him through the uh, T-tube. Initially went down, and we had a very clear view of uh, his carina. There was no distal obstruction. And as we go up, We 
can see how he could compress uh, the upper end of the chichu with his, uh, his glottis. Uh, probably that's the reason why he was not uh, aspirating with, with feet. But he also had a good um, airway proximally. So that is how his airway looked like. So um, I'll discuss briefly about uh, T-tubes. So laryngotracheal stenosis is a challenging problem in the field of uh, laryngology. And uh, you should note that ideal treatment should be individualized as exemplified by this case I've just presented. And management demands a multidisciplinary team approach and there is usually need for multiple uh, uh, procedures uh, for, for you to be successful in managing this case. So the treatment goals, uh, the most important treatment goal is airway patterns. Uh, and you also want to maintain your tick competence to protect against aspiration. And uh, you also want to accept, to, to achieve an acceptable voice quality in uh, patients who are, who are voicing. So again, uh, permanent uh, tracheostomy is, uh, is you know, one of the oldest and simplest uh, methods in managing these uh, uh, pathologies. Uh, however, it comes with these uh, limitations uh, that one, if patients are unable to connect without occluding the stoma, and uh, there is that inherent disfigurement, disfigurement associated with wearing a tracheostomy tube and uh, inability to engage in some uh, recreational uh, activities like swimming. So common causes of laryngeal tracheal stenosis, uh, trauma is high on the list, uh, followed by prolonged intubation and uh, complications of uh, tracheostomy. And we have got other causes that we then causes caustic injury, granulomatous uh, diseases, and as well as TB, which is more important in uh, our context. So uh, according to Scott Brown, uh, indications for stenting in benign disease include uh, long length stenosis above stenosis greater than four centimeters. If there is failed previous repair, uh, the, the patient has got uh, comorbidities that restrict reconstructive surgery. Uh, you also pa patient preference for you know, patient circumstances, and they can also be used uh, for temporary use uh, following a surgery. These are general indications for dengue. And if you look at T-tubes, uh, initially T-tubes were invented uh, by William Montgomery. That was in 1962. Uh, in our institution, we use the board type uh, T-tubes. They are relatively safe and they are effective. They are well tolerated by patients and they are uh, quite easy to operate and they provide adequate symptomatic um, relief. I also looked at this uh, article which was published in 2014, which was a single center retrospective analysis of about 546 uh, cases. So they evaluated these uh, stenosis using, using the Cotton Meyer dating method, and their primary endpoint was the rate, the rate of successful extubation, and safety was their secondary endpoint. So initially, in terms of their results, they found that uh, T-tubes were successful, T-tubes were successfully extubated in about 342 patients in six to 24 months following intubation. And then the initial extubation success rate was 62.3%. And however, about 192 patients required a re-intubation re uh, because of laryngeal restenosis post extubation. And then the success rate at second attempt was about 59.9%, with an overall success rate of 83.3%. And uh, their complications were hemolysis in about eight patients, post-operative infection in six patient, patients, wound diseases in three patients, laryngeal obstruction in 18 patients, 12 patients, 12 of their patients uh, aspirated, and uh, post-op uh, tracheosophageous fistula in two patients. So in this series, they demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of uh, T2 for grade one and two Cotton Meyer stenosis with 
stenotic segment less than six centimeters. And for those being more than six centimeters, uh, and where tracheal end-to-end -end anastomosis is not appropriate, uh, they recommended a long-term placement of, of T-tubes. So if you look at uh, uh, the T-tube features compared to other types of skin, they've got uh, smooth inner and outer holes, which basically maintains the expectorate uh, function of uh, the respiratory mucosa. They, their surfaces are highly polished, which makes it less likely for um, a mucus a retention or mucus to stick on the surfaces. And uh, they've got an internal branch and an external branch. The external branch is as a support which uh, reduces the incidence of skin uh, migration. And they come uh, in different models with varying diameters, which make them suitable for patients with uh, different tracheal uh, diameters. And the external branch can be open in cases of proximal obstruction, uh, and they are uh, generally simple and uh, safe uh, to place and remove. Well, if you look at the contraindications uh, of, of tissue placement, because you need to uh, uh, put your patient into a direct uh, bronchoscopy, you and to put your patient into general anesthesia, uh, you find that it's contraindicated in patients with restrained head and neck movements, that is patients with head and neck malformation, neck fixation, patients with restrained mouth opening, uh, for example, patients with maxillo, facial uh, trauma, bands, uh, oral deformities, patients with Christmas, and generally patients who are unfit for general anesthesia. So in terms of your airway assessment, you should start with an adequate history and physical examination, because your tissue specifications will be determined by your pre and intra-op findings. You want to determine the extent and severity of your stenosis. Uh, you want to uh, determine the distance of your stenosis from the glottis and the carina, and obtain a CT scan uh, of the neck and thorax. And you know, you need to weigh your risk and benefit, especially in patients with documented uh, history of aspiration. And you should need to also need to make sure that your upper end of the tube should be below the upper pores. And then the tube diameter should be smaller than the airway, otherwise you run a risk of uh, pressure compression on the airway and increased risk of granulation tissue hyperplasia and a blockage of your tissue. And again, your tissue should not be too small because you run the risk of um, easy obstruction from casting. And then uh, if you look at the complications of uh, T-tubes, they can be either early complications or late. Uh, early complications, they can be upper. Airways obstruction, you need to vigilantly uh, uh, monitor your airway postoperatively. Uh, they get excess mucus secretions, uh, irritating pop and bleeding uh, from the stoma side. A late complication by far the most common complication is granulation tissue uh, hyperplasia, which uh, is common in the upper end of your tissue uh, due to uh, the tissue being displaced when the patient connects or when they swallow, or when your tissue is too close to the vocal cords causing irritation, you run the risk of uh, granulation tissue hyperplasia. And your tissue can also well be blocked by thick secretions, so it is important to consider your patient that the external component of the tissue should always be close to approved dry air going in and causing dry air sputter. And you can as well get secondary infection. And in terms of follow-up, uh, extubation timing is determined by the patient's uh, circumstances. You want to review the patient's condition uh, post-operatively if uh, they have an adequate cope, are they uh, trained to expectorate uh, their sputum and you want to do serial endoscopic examination just to make sure you, you plan according. So patients should be reassessed uh, every, patients on prolonged, uh, uh, with prolonged T-tube should be reassessed every nine uh, to 12 months uh, for either extubation or replacement of the T-tubes. In our institution, we usually keep the tubes for uh, about a year unless there are any uh, complications prior to that. And then extubation of T-tubes is easy. There are two ways to do this. It's either you pull the side uh, branch 
in order to extract the tube from the trachea, or either intraoperatively you can cut the ex external loop or external branch, and then you pull the internal branch with forceps through a rigid endoscope. Thank you. Thank you for the once more for the opportunity to present. Over to you, Tasia. Uh, thank you very, very much, Charles. That was an excellent presentation with a really a multidisciplinary um, um, uh, example of how to manage a patient. Thank you very, very much. Um, any comments or questions I'd, I'd invite now before we move on to our second case? Uh, I'd like to perhaps invite uh, Professor Fagan. Any comments uh, from your side on this case, Prof? No, no, no comment here. Um, I think the important thing here is the patient was was uh, was communicating by clicking, so so it didn't have to generate any any sound uh, sound to the larynx, and um, and so that's where the whole debate came up uh, up whether we could isolate the larynx from the from the rest of the airway or or even do a laryngectomy, but obviously if you can get away with a conservative approach, um, that would be first prize. But it's a very nice presentation, and I think we need to get you to write a chapter for our open access um, uh, uh, so textbook on how to insert and um, and how to remove T tubes, Charles. Thank you, Prof. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, very much, Prof. Um, I had a question for uh, Professor Hill, um, and I think Prof Hill, you had alluded to this uh, during the presentation and biopsying part of the mucosa of, uh, of the stenosis. It might not be relevant in this case who had a childhood history of croup, uh, but uh, when you're thinking about uh, granulomatous diseases, sarcoid and, and those kind of differentials, uh, is this something that you would advocate in and how often uh, do you see this in your practice? Good morning. Uh, laryngeal stenosis um, can be due to various factors, but if there is uh, eight granulomatous tissue, you obviously think about TB first. Um, and um, obviously that needs to be investigated. Secondly, one can have amyloidosis. Uh, that usually is not seen in young kids, but uh, in older patients, one needs to think about the possibility of idiopathic amyloid deposition, which we see in the larynx, or associated with uh, a systemic hematological disease like uh, myeloma, or even um, extended chronic, local chronic inflammation that can also be associated with amyloid deposition. So the thing is that um, yeah, obviously uh, amyloid deposition is quite difficult to remove. And uh, yeah, one needs just to manage uh, on an ad hoc basis, I think. Great, thank you very, very much, Prof. Hill. Thank you, Charles, and everyone else who participated in this, uh, this, this uh, very, a very healthy discussion. Uh, I'd like to now move on to our second case um, uh, from Dr. Samuel Okorosi. Uh, Dr. Samuel Okorosi is a consultant who practices at the Machakos Level 5 Hospital in Kenya, uh, who has kindly agreed to present an interesting case that presented to his facility there. Um, Dr. Okorosi, um, please, uh, over to you. Thank you, Tassir. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, is everyone able to see that? Yeah, yes, we can see it. You, you may need to just put it in presentation view. All right. All right, so thank you for the opportunity to present in um, this forum. Uh, as Tassir has said, my name is uh, Dr. Kirosi. Uh, I'm an ENT surgeon at uh, Machitakos Level 5 Hospital. Um, I got uh, verbal consent from the patient to present this case. And there's also no conflict of interest that I need to declare. So straight away to the case, uh, I'm presenting um, a male patient, uh, PK, who, was a, who is a 52-year-old male, um, he presented to our facility sometime in uh, June, early June, late, late May, early June, uh, late May actually, and uh, he 
came in with a history of a sore throat, which was on and off for two years. Uh, he had self-medicated with analgesics, but uh, he said the sore throats were just not going away. And uh, eventually he reported that uh, there was associated um, otalgia bilaterally, though there was no hearing loss. Um, so at that particular point in time, especially when the otalgia developed, uh, he said he would visit medical facilities and he would be treated for tonsillitis, but uh, the situation did not improve. And um, thereafter, he says that he began to develop difficulty swallowing. Um, and this was eight months before the presentation. And at that time, he was referred to uh, see an ENT surgeon. So um, I think uh, with that history, maybe any volunteers who would uh, suggest what they think may be going on with him. Right. So I, I think in the interest of time, uh, we can proceed. So with this, and after being sent to see an ENT surgeon, um, the ENT surgeon uh, did a rigid laryngoscopy, which was in uh, February of uh, this month. Um, I mean, February of this year. And um, the report was that uh, he, he, he saw a post cricoid fungating mass. And with that, um, the patient was scheduled to, to do a CT scan of the neck and also a direct laryngoscopy and biopsy. So as... Um, the issue Limited, so had the direct laryngoscopy and biopsy done as a well differentiated tumor cell carcinoma. Um, 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 it's a no history, uh, no history of alcohol intake. The smoking was about four cigarettes for about four years. It was not, it was not as um, um, a very significant history of uh, prolonged smoking, uh, which would become to about 16 over 20 per year. If you were to calculate. Um, so when he presented to us uh, on examination, this is in um, uh, late May, we saw he's a middle-aged male. He was of a good general condition. Um, and his neck, the laryngeal framework was not widened, um, but there was loss of laryngeal crepitus. And uh, there was a palpable left uh, level three node, which was three by three centimeters. Uh, the other examination was essentially unremarkable. We didn't do a laryngoscopy. Um, and uh, that's simply because we did not have the rigid laryngoscopes and also the, the restrictions with the coronavirus as well. His performance status was also good. Uh, I staged him as an uh, echo stage of one. Now, these are some of the images from, um, that we managed to get from him. This was his laryngoscopy. Um, he, um, from this, we can see on the topmost, uh, on, the, uh, on the left, you can see that there's actually a post cricoid mass actually extending towards the right um, pericom sinus, the medial wall, slightly where the retinoid is. You can also see a bit of pooling of uh, saliva at that region. When he presented to us, his uh, dysphagia was grade three. Uh, and then you can also see that uh, the larynx seems to be opened well but uh, this pulling posteriorly. Um, now, this was in February, which was a whole four months before uh, he presented to us. And the delay of presentation was purely because of uh, funds. Uh, we also had a CT scan from him, uh, which was also done uh, in February. Uh, it was not in the best condition, the CT scan. And um, the, the few images that we were able to see um, would just show us that uh, maybe there's just a bit of a post-cricoid 
fullness, but there appeared to be a plane between it and the, um, the, the prevertebral tissues. So with that, well, we decided to admit him. Um, and um, in our minds, we thought that um, we'll, we'll, we'll decide on table. Um, clear. We went into the mind that we'll do a hypopharyngectomy um, and decide whether it would be um, a total or a partial um, or a, a circumferential or a partial uh, pharyngectomy. Um, now, on assessment, uh, preoperatively, we noted that um, he had a postcricoid tumor extending bilaterally to both piriform fossas. Um, and there was also, uh, the tumor was also on the medial and lateral wall of the, uh, of the piriform and also at the piriform apex. The posterior pharyngeal wall was not uh, involved. So we staged him as a T, T3 and 2A um, MO uh, tumor. And um, we made the decision that uh, we'll do a total laryngopharyngectomy on him um, based on the extent of the tumor and the involvement of the postcricoid and the piriform uh, apexes bilaterally. Um, and with that, we also say that we reconstruct him using a pectoralis major myocutaneous uh, uh, flap. So these are the surface markings um, pre-op. The, um, this is the site of the pectoralis major harvest. Um, this is the incision that we had planned to make. Uh, it's like a, a bilateral boomerang incision with an area of um, you know, where the tracheostoma would be. You can note that uh, he had no respiratory distress and he was actually, the intubation was actually uneventful. Um, so we did the neck dissection first, and then uh, this image is just to show us accessing the prevertebral uh, space. Uh, from the left, this is the flap, uh, which has been uh, reflected posteriorly. And after the bilateral neck dissection and uh, the total laryngopharyngectomy, we have this defect now, of which we needed to reconstruct. And we did so using a um, uh, pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. Um, I'll uh, discuss a bit more on the reconstruction later, but this is the specimen that we had. You can see the bilateral, um, it was an end block uh, dissection, the bilateral uh, level two to four lymph node dissection. You can note that you have the postcricoid tumor here involving both the left and uh, the right piriform sinus. There's a bit of a submucosal extension. And um, this is part of the esophagus as well. So, Postoperatively, he did well. Drains are out on the third post-op day, that, um, that, and that's for the chest. For the neck, we removed the drains at, uh, on the sixth day. Um, he, however, developed uh, a wound dehiscence of the um, suture line, uh, the and, uh, superior, left superior um, surface of the or incision area. Uh, of which we decided to let it heal by secondary intention. Feeding, uh, he began to feed at, uh, the, on the 14th day postoperatively, and no fistulas were noted. Uh, we discharged him after about four weeks, um, once the, the, the wound dehiscence had actually contracted markedly. When we got the full histopathology report, uh, we, were, we were happy that they were, the margins were negative, but there was lymphovascular and perineural invasion, and three out of the 25 lymph nodes uh, were involved with uh, extra nodal extension. And for that, we referred him for, uh, to the radio-oncologist and he's currently receiving chemoradiotherapy, which was started about uh, 12 weeks post-op. Uh, he's currently on his uh, seventh uh, radio um, therapy session and he's received one, uh, one cycle of chemotherapy. Um, this is a photo that was taken uh, on review about two two days ago, um, we can see that the skin incision has healed together with um, the harvest site. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it appears that he's developing some keloid, um, of which will probably be addressed um, after the radiotherapy. And um, we also noted that uh, his stomach uh, had started to look like it was stenosing, of which we prescribed the um, uh, tracheostoma tube. Uh, now, um, just a bit of uh, 
review on hypopharyngeal cancers. Uh, they account for about three to five percent of head and neck uh, malignancies. In Kenya, the data that I got was that um, there was a, a review by um, a dissertation of one of our colleagues in the ENT department in 2006 of patients presenting to Kenyatta Hospital, head and neck patients, and um, it uh, ranked or it appeared that it was accounting for five point seven percent of the head and neck cases in KNH at that time, though the sample was small, about 170 patients. Um, it mostly affects adult males in the seventh decade of life, uh, but for females, um, most of the tumors they get is a post-cricoid tumor and usually associated with uh, the Plummer Vinson syndrome. Um, the risk factors, um, I mean, the smoking and alcohol are the biggest risk factors. In fact, they say alcohol is more of a risk factor for hypopharyngeal cancers than um, in the larynx. But um, they also suspect HPV to be one of the other risk factors. Um, it's been found in about 10% of hypopharyngeal cancer uh, specimens. The other um, risk factors are occupational exposure to coal dust, steel dust, iron compounds. Others also say that um, the, um, yeah, Diet low in fruits and vegetables is a risk factor. Um, uh, Laryngopharyngeal reflux has been uh, suspected as a possible risk factor, especially for post cricoid tumors. And, uh, um, but the main ones are smoking and alcohol. Now, it's usually diagnosed late, um, and this is uh, due to the, the, the presentation itself. Um, we see that uh, for our patient, he had this sore throat for two years. Um, which he, he managed conservatively. No, and it's only until he started developing this failure that um, he, he started taking it a bit seriously. Now, um, the other characteristic of hypopharyngeal cancer is that they have this uh, submucosal spread and hence they require wide resection margins. Usually they say the, the spread is worse inferiorly. So uh, usually the inferior margin, uh, one would like to have um, at least a three centimeter uh, macroscopic um, uh, uh, resection margin. Um, it also affects uh, swallowing, it affects speech as well because um, the anterior relation of the hypopharynx is the, the larynx. So certain literature report that hypopharyngeal cancers are actually one of the worst um, prognostically head and neck cancers. And um, they, 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 they encourage that, uh, um, or the, 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 um, the reason why they say that it's, it's one of the worst is due to the late presentation. So you typically find patients presenting in stage three or four uh, disease. Now, just a bit of the review on the anatomy. This is um, a posterior view. You can see that the, post, uh, the, the hypopharynx has been cut midline and opened up. So you can see the subsets. This is the post region. This is the piriform sinuses. Uh, this is the left. This is the right piriform sinus. And the other part that you're not seeing is the posterior pharyngeal wall, which is the other subset. Uh, in terms of staging, we use the TNM staging, and uh, I think what's relevant for us is for our patient, um, we staged him as T3 because uh, on, uh, on endoscope or on uh, the direct laryngos laryngoscopy preoperatively, uh, we thought the tumor was more than four centimeters, and um, well, we didn't assess the, the movement of the larynx, but to the hoarseness, we suspected that uh, probably uh, one of the laryngeal um, the, one of the, the cords was immobile. There could have been a fixed uh, cord. Now, um, when it comes to management options for hypopharyngeal cancers, it could either, uh, um, it depends on the stage. There's uh, stage one, stage two, which is early disease, uh, stage three, four, late disease. Early disease uh, is usually single modality, could be radiotherapy, could be surgical. Uh, but late disease is usually a combination. Now, um, for the surgical options, you could have the transoral uh, or open. Transoral is usually for early disease. Um, the T1, T2 tumors with no nodal extension, uh, where you 
you could use either a transoral uh, laser micro resection of the tumor or um, uh, transoral robotic surgery. Um, but in our setup, we, we honestly do not have that. So that was not an option. Well, even the tumor stage uh, did not make this an option. For open, um, you have to always think of what you'll do with the larynx um, because um, you'll do your pharyngectomy and be a partial pharyngectomy. And this is usually um, if the tumor, if, if you can actually get pharyngeal mucosa, which you can uh, use to close. And that is, um, uh, um, as long as you can have a strip of pharyngeal mucosa, it would be partial. And this would typically be for tumors which affect the piriform sinus, either the medial or lateral wall. Um, or even the posterior pharyngeal wall, as long as it's not extending anteriorly. Um, and then um, circumferential pharyngectomy is usually for quite uh, extensive tumors, where um, if you assess the resection margin, you will not be able to get the wide resection margin. You typically go with a total pharyngectomy or a, con a circumferential uh, pharyngectomy. For the laryngectomy, it could be partial, could be total, but in our patients, um, the indication for the total laryngectomy was that it was involving the uh, post-cricoid region. So the risk with it involving the cricoid cartilage uh, in terms of even getting tumor margins was there. So we had to do a total laryngectomy. The other indication for total laryngectomy is um, um, if the uh, piriform apex is also involved. Uh, then there's also this concept of a near total laryngectomy where you actually create more of a valve, uh, which is used as a speaking valve uh, for the patient, but um, it's not adequate enough for the patient to breathe in. Yeah. So um, I think now this is a part where I'd want us to discuss about the reconstruction. Uh, we did a total laryngopharyngectomy and uh, for sure it requires a reconstruction. And the options are multiple. Uh, there are free flaps, uh, there are local flaps, there are other flaps, including gastric pull-up, uh, colonic transposition. Now for the free flaps, you could use a radial form free flap, um, anterolateral tie flap, or a jejunal free flap. And for the local flaps, some of the flaps are supraclavicular, submental, or pectoralis major uh, myocutaneous flap. But um, it's worth noting that um, there are a lot of factors that go to deciding um, reconstructive options. And one of them is um, the surgical um, ability. Um, it would be nice if um, one has access to microvascular um, speciality as well. Uh, but in our setup, we, we are two ENT surgeons and one part-time head and neck surgeon who works pro bono, and uh, we have two plastic surgeons in training. So maybe when they come back, uh, their repertoire of uh, reconstruction will increase, maybe be able to do free flaps. But for the moment, uh, what we're able to do is the pectoralis major uh, myocutaneous flap. And um, I think this is a very um, good flap in the sense that um, one, uh, it's, uh, relatively uh, straightforward to raise. Um, it's within, well, the wider field of the operation. So um, it, it takes a bit, of, it takes a shorter time to raise. Um, where the pedicle is found, it's actually the, the pedicle is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial uh, uh, artery. And um, it's found between the, uh, the lower aspect of the pectoralis major fascia and the pectoralis minor muscle. So it's easy to locate and um, easy to raise. I think for the technical aspect of how to raise it, that, that um, you can uh, see the um, uh, bulla, um, um, pectoralis major um, muscle harvest and uh, 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 utility. Um, it's well described there, so I didn't want to take too much time uh, describing it. But the advantages is it's within limit, it's very robust, um, and uh, knowledge of use of this flap, th this flap can be used both for the hypopharynx and multiple other areas for reconstruction in the head of the neck. Now, just specifically on hypopharyngeal um, reconstruction using a pectoralis major myocutaneous flap, and this is mostly for the circumferential uh, um, defects, 
Initially, it was tubularized, and this was back in 1970. The, the flap was discovered in 1979, and within the same year, it was used to actually uh, attempt to close a hypopharyngeal defect. But uh, what was noted was that the, the flap is bulky, um, and it's uh, difficult to manipulate. Um, and uh, some of the surgeons were worried about um, how that would also affect like, the blood supply. So it was theorized to have a high um, pharyngocutaneous fistula rate. So a few years later, an author by the name of Fabian um, used a different technique rather than tubularizing it. Um, once you have the circumferential defect, you would place a skin graft, a split thickness skin graft on the posterior uh, pharyngeal wall, and then suture the, uh, the, the muscle flap, the major muscle flap to the prevertebral fascia. But um, he, um, he described this in about two patients, but more patients who had strictures uh, of the, uh, the pharynx uh, post radiotherapy. And then Spirano, um, is the one who described uh, suturing the pectoralis major myocutaneous flap directly onto the prevertebral fascia. Um, and this was, um, it actually helped, especially because the, with, the, with the bulky flap, just laying it over the, um, the, pector, the prevertebral fascia creates a bigger space, a bigger, um, uh, how do I call it, pharyngeal, a bigger neopharynx. And uh, that's the technique that we used to close the, the pharynx. So the first thing is after the resection, you can see that this is the, the um, oropharynx and uh, the stump of the esophagus. The posterior aspects are, were sutured to the prevertebral uh, fascia. And then this pectoralis major flap now was brought in and um, sutured laterally on the um, prevertebral priva fascia. And then now we flipped it over to suture it over um, the, to suture it over the oropharyngeal uh, mucosa, the anterior part, and the uh, anterior part of the esophagus. And uh, the rest of the flap now was sutured to the other surface of the prevertebral fascia. Now, um, when I was reviewing the literature, um, I saw that um, Kiza uh, et al. had um, actually done a, a review of literature of the use of the pectoralis major flap in uh, hypopharyngeal reconstructions together with the, other, with the three flaps, the radial, the um, um, anterolateral, and the jejunal. And um, in terms of, um, I think what's important here is in terms of the flap failure, you can see that the pectoralis major flap had the least uh, failure rate. Uh, however, uh, in terms of the uh, pharyngocutaneous fistula and stenosis, it was higher, but um, uh, with a caveat that uh, if this is the flap that you can use, then use it. And their conclusion was that uh, the head and head surgeon should be able to have an armament of flaps to be able to use. So um, these are the other options and uh, the pec major is still a flap that can be used as well. Um, and also just to note that this um, was both for uh, subtotal and circumferential hypopharyngectomy uh, defects. So in conclusion, um, I'd say that um, the setting determines the reconstructive option and the uh, pectoralis major myocutaneous uh, flap sutured on the prevertebral fascia had good results in our patient. In our patient, uh, and these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Okorosi. Thank you for the very comprehensive and uh, interesting case presentation. Um, I'd like to immediately uh, uh, give Professor Fagan the, the cue to, to for, for any comments from his side, please. Samuel, thank you very much. That was really a good presentation. Um, um, and I was interested by this technique where you suture it to, to the pre-vertebral fascia because that's something which I haven't ever tried. Um, um, you know, in my experience, uh, if you do get stenosis, often it's at the at the distal, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's at the distal elastomosis site where you we join the flap onto the esophagus. 
and um, and you can get a stricturing there. Um, so that's the area that you want to look at very carefully when you do your repair. Uh, leak rates um, are a problem uh, uh, with the big major flaps. Um, I think it's probably with any skin to mucosa to sort of repair. And, uh, and we have to accept that that's something that we have to deal with. Um, um, I, um, I was just curious why you got a CT scan done. I mean, in a resource constrained setting, I'm not sure the CT scan would have changed your management. Um, so I'd be interested in that. And also I was interested by your skin incision of your of initial um, exposure of the neck. Um, I would have, uh, I mean, I just traditionally uh, make, a, make a flap which is based superiorly. Um, but I was just interested as to why you use that, that incision because it looks very interesting. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. True enough, the, um, the, posterior, the, the inferior um, anastomotic site is what gets the, um, the, um, the stricture mostly. And um, some have actually um, described that they would interdigitate the, the flap to the esophagus, um, though we, that's not what we did. Um, and in terms of the incision, um, I don't know if you can still see my screen. Uh, or let me just share it briefly. The, I mean, the, um, in terms of the incision, um, it's a. I guess it was just personal preference, not in terms of uh, any any any. Uh, well, I can't I can't scroll, but uh, just personal preference. And the other maybe um, reason for that incision would be um, if at all the. Um, what do you call it? The submental flap, though we, I mean, in this case, we were not definitely going to use it. So, yeah, I guess it's not. Okay. Um, Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Kerusi, for that uh, presentation. Um, I just have uh, a comment about it. Um, and to give Dr. Musioka the, the yeah, comments. Yeah, yeah, so um, uh, I did the operation. I did the operation with uh, Dr. Karosi and Dr. Masharia, and the reason of basing the flap inferiorly is, is so that we can save the submental of flap just in case you have a, a full day sense or failure somewhere of the flap taking, then you have that option of uh, using a submental of flap. That's why we base it inferiorly. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Sam, did you want to show us something on the slide? Uh, no, just the, the incision itself, which we can see now. Ah, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I know when you, when you mentioned that there are uh, resource constrictions at Machakos, you mentioned that there are just two uh, ENT surgeons and one pro bono surgeon. So I know your, your colleague is Dr. Ian Masharia. Thanks for that comment. And the pro bono surgeon is Dr. Musioka. So thank you very much, Dr. Musioka, as well, for your comment as well. Um, I see Professor Hill has raised his hand. Uh, Prof. Hill, please uh, go on. Yes, good morning. Um, the one thing that I have uh, understood and learned is that uh, one usually doesn't chase dysplasia in the esophagus. Uh, sorry, in the head and neck, but with the exception of the hypopharynx, because it's such an aggressive cancer, one tries to make sure that the margin is also free of dysplasia. Uh, was this done in this case? Um, the margins being free of dysplasia, well, they reported negative margins, though in terms of comment for, for dysplasia, um, specifically dysplasia, no, but they gave the, um, sorry, I, I, I wish I could project, uh, but I can read it out. But um, in terms of margins, epiglottic mucosal margin was uh, two centimeters, tracheal cartilage. They, they just give the, the distance from the tumor site, but not a comment on whether there was any dysplasia. Though I would, I would um, I'd think that that would be something that they would comment on if, if it was there. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, the, okay, so basically what I would like to um, then suggest is that, you know, the, 
international uh, collaboration of cancer reporting, which merges all the criteria for head and neck cancer diagnosis and resections uh, that were issued by the Australian College of Pathology, the uh, Royal College of Pathology, and the American uh, Society of Pathology. They have been merging in a pro forma reporting form for most of the head and neck sites. And one of the important things is that uh, one should report um, additional pathology. Um, and that includes if there is dysplasia or not either adjacent to the tumor or even in other areas. And definitely the margins in the hypopharynx area, there should be a comment on whether dysplasia extends to the mucosal margins or not. So there is a um, there is this pro forma, and I think that I should have to disseminate this, then so that your local pathologist can actually follow uh, this protocol. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll get it and uh, probably share it with uh, some of our pathology it, colleagues. Yeah, is there any way I can send the forms to you or to anybody else by email? Yes, yes. They are, um, they are downloadable from the website, so I can um, even give you the HTTP from which to download it. Yes, I think on the chat function, if you're able to comment on it, I'll be able to pick it up. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, I see our time is, is, is nearing to an end now. Uh, Dr. Okorosi, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation that has spared a a great discussion. Any closing comments from your side? Um, for me, none. But I, I think um, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ms. Yoka as well, who's logged in through probably, he's on the other side of this wall. That's our theater. Maybe he can give some closing remarks. Uh, yeah. That's all right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kurosi, for an excellent uh, presentation. But I think we just need to popularize uh, Hypopharyngeal uh, surgery in uh, this part of the world because I've realized uh, it's, it's not a common surgery that is routinely done and that we need to offer a patient that option. So it's a technique and, uh, that, that all the head and neck surgeons and ENT should embrace. Thank you. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musioka, for that comment. Um, and thank you once again to both our speakers for participating in today's uh, multinational discussion. Um, I'm going to end the, the session now. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you now for next week's uh, presentations on Wednesdays and, and Friday. Um, as you may have seen today, if, you, if uh, you're joining us and you have interesting cases from your institution, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to one of us and we can uh, uh, put you in and I'll slot you in for one of these Days so that we can hear and learn from your institution as well. Uh, but thank you once again to our presenters and for everyone who has participated in the discussion and for everyone that has joined us uh, as an attendee. Take care and have a, a lovely weekend ahead.